I was wondering, uh, a guitar player like yourself, with the kind of chops you have, can you really, uh, uh, is the rockabilly uh, format enough for you to uh, display on your talents, or do you find yourself being frustrated, boxed in? No, if I'm not at all, because, I mean, it's just me up there. I can do anything I want. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the kind of music that I choose to portray my guitar playing. Uh, and I think um, even recently I've been experimenting more and more and using different effects sparingly. <laughs> and I, I find it the most open, you know, palette for me, you know. Uh, the first solo album, uh, seemed like it had a much more serious flavor to it. Uh, are, can we assume that that's the real you? Uh... No, that's, that's the, uh, that's when I was, Brian Setzer going through a phase that he didn't know who he was. I didn't, I was trying to be a million things, I didn't know what, you know, this is the real me. Uh, although there were some good songs on that record, uh, I just, I listen back to it and I don't, I think there's some great guitar playing on it, but I don't feel comfortable with the things I was saying, it wasn't really me. Right. Hmm. You're trying to say something too too bold, trying to overstep yourself. I don't really know. I just didn't feel. I went on tour with it, and I certainly I didn't feel comfortable playing that sort of stuff. I mean, I I didn't get up there and sweat and get people screaming and yelling. I mean, that's mm. that's what I want to do. I want to I want to have fun and and play play guitar and uh, I just uh, trying to put in the words. It it just wasn't a very good time period of my life. You know, I don't think I really, I think it was kind of what other people might want to want to say, rather than what I want to say, you know. Um, this is a question based on, based on a hypothesis. Uh, they say, let's say some people uh, uh, assert that rock and roll should be a, a vivid representation of the times. Uh, they might criticize your band as being, you know, uh, something from the past. Right. Yeah, yes, but I, I don't quite know what it means because I mean I don't consider you know I don't I don't consider blues or I don't consider jazz to be twenties music hmm. you know I don't you know I, I don't consider blues to be forties music hmm. you know I just rock you know real real rock and roll rockabilly music was invented in the 50s absolutely and the, and the 50s period is where I base myself from that's the base mm. and then I bring it out from there you know mm. absolutely but I mean uh, I don't think many people wore their hair like this in 56 you know <laughs> just you know I just uh, base myself from that time period of, of guitar playing more or less mm. that's where I like to base myself and then take it from there you know mm. Uh, this is kind of a tough question. He says, like, you know, uh, uh, you do a couple of Eddie Cochran tunes on, on stage. Well, yeah, they always change. Yeah, but he was saying, like, back then that was, like, a, you know, very contemporary uh, at the time, of course. How about your music now? What, what, what makes it contemporary? Well, I think we're taking, you know, like what the next album we'll be doing, you know, we're, we'll be using Nile Rogers producing. Mm -hmm. And I think we're, we're the only thing that is a remnant of the 1950s is uh, is uh, the stand-up bass and the Gretsch guitar mm -hmm. and everything else we're, we're going to keep the Stray Cat sound by using that and use all sorts of different things to make it modern we're going to have you know different instruments behind us and a, maybe a synthesizer track mm -hmm. behind us but it'll still be us playing mm -hmm. so that's what I think makes it modern and it, and it's still that that art form of, of you know rockabilly music, which uh, I can't explain, you know, why it does so much for me. You know, it's like a, you look at a beautiful woman, and that why is why is she so special to you? It just is. Hmm. You know. um, do you feel uh, uh, this is going to overlap with the first question? But you're obviously more comfortable with the rockabilly format than, rather than uh, you know when, when you can go, you said that when you were solo, you didn't quite know what you wanted to do. I guess you... Well, the first album I didn't. The second album was getting more into a rock and roll thing. Huh. 
prefer yeah, the Yeah, I, yeah I, I don't see the big deal. I mean, Poison and Warrant play 70s rock and roll. I mean, they've got long hair down here. They wear makeup. Nobody calls it 70s rock and roll. And they all sound the same. There's a thousand bands like that. And they're playing some bullshit hybrid heavy metal music. That's the same old crap. So if we want to do rockabilly, I don't see what the big problem is. <laughs> people love it. I love it. And I'm the best rockabilly guitarist in the world. And there's not many people that can make that claim to, as to being the best in something. So I feel when you do something the best, that you should stick with that, hmm. that route and you should expand from there. Hmm. You know? Are you very familiar with other people who do rockabilly stuff? There's a lot, a lot of rockabilly bands, you know. Right. Thousands. Where? Well, they don't have, most of them don't have major deals. It's uh, mostly an underground thing. Uh -huh. But uh, the, most of the good rockabilly bands now come from Europe. Uh, there's some great ones in, we heard some great ones in Japan. Mm -hmm. you know, this, it, it's huge. I mean, I, there's stag stacks of underground magazines. I mean, <laughs> it's an underground thing, pretty much. I mean, uh -huh. it's not as popular as, uh, you know. It's not on the surface, like Paula Abdul and Warrant and Poison and all those bands, but it's a very popular art form. Why do you think you guys stand head and shoulders above the pack? Well, I don't think the other bands have done enough to make it really modern music. I don't think the other bands can really play that well. You know, they they get the look going and they just kind of bash it out. And they call it psychobilly, you know, but... I mean, we're all really good musicians, you know. I mean, and I just think that uh, there's not enough originality in that sort of genre from these bands. Huh. You know, there's definitely not in the heavy metal category, but for some reason, you know, that's what 14-year-old girls like, you know. They, they want to buy Bon Jovi records and all the, all the um, you know, look-alikes. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. It's just the way it is, you know. Like formulas. Yeah, they like that formula for some reason. You know, our formula, I think, is more for it, it's more of a hardcore thing. You know, mm -hmm. it'll always be an underground thing, like like punk. You know, I guess in your case, though, you guys never have really fallen into that sort of formula syndrome. But maybe that's what keeps you fresh and uh, popular. I try to make it not sound like you know just one four five blues stuff. But I mean, I don't. I to me, it was always the most exciting music in the world. <laughs> you know, to me, for me, blues. It's just like it's. I, lo I love the blues, but you can't dance to it, you know. Mm. The rock really had it all. It was aggressive. It was original. You could dance to it. Had a look. It was young. It was exciting. It had everything going for it, you know. You know it wasn't. I don't know. Mm. Don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, rockabilly is an easy one. That's pretty amazing how you can translate that. I, I, I don't get a word. <laughs> Uh, did you always have the, the tattoos and the, and the hairdo even before uh, you guys formed the band? Yeah, well, about the same time. I got my first tattoo when I was about 16. Hmm. Before that, I was painting them on my arms. Hmm. I just always wanted them. Hmm. That goes a little beyond the rock and roll thing. That's a that's a that's an artistic thing. I think that I'd have, uh, hmm. you know. But it, it goes hand in hand with it. You're from New York, right? Yeah, uh -huh. my first tattoo I got in the loft on 33rd and 3rd. We, we cut high school. But we started to do it about the same time, yeah. Wait, so you and your friends were getting tattoos? Me and Jim, uh -huh. the drummer of the band. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. But we, we would go out even before we, we could get tattoos. We were like 14. We always wanted them. We would paint them on our arms hmm. and get them. And <laughs> just uh, your lifestyle. This is not part of the act or anything. This is who you are. Right. This, yeah. is, this is the lifestyle. This is the way I feel comfortable, you know. Uh -huh. I don't feel comfortable... You know, I don't know, I look at, I don't know, the lead singer from a heavy metal band, I don't feel comfortable with, you know, long hair and eye makeup and scarves, and, you know, I feel comfortable looking like this, I don't know, <laughs> yes, that's, that's my lifestyle. Is that the guys from the neighborhood look, where you come from? Well, where I come from, you had to have a baloney in your pants, you know, and you had... <laughs> You know, it was Spinal Tap, and yeah, I just never felt comfortable with that. I, I liked um, basing myself with the rebellion and, and the look of the 50s, but with the attitude of, uh, of punk music, you know. I, 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 that's how I felt comfortable, yeah. This is going to be a tough one to answer again, but why was the, uh, the, the 50s look, the, the rebel look, the most uh, attractive to you? In, in more specific terms, why, why does that appeal to you? Well, I guess because 
it's kind of like you don't have to look like a girl to to to, to do it. I mean, it was kind of a masculine look, mm -hmm. uh, and that's what I associated with more than a feminine look. And at the mm -hmm. time I was growing up, glam rock seemed to be the biggest mm -hmm. thing, you know. And uh, um, I, there was nothing else to associate with at the time. It was just you know long hair and and and, and like you know flowing capes. <laughs> It was too effeminate for me. I, so I associated with that look and the attitude of the masculinity of it, you know. Uh, and then when the punk thing came around, it was rock and roll again. So I associated with that musically. Mm -hmm. I thought if I could combine these two looks, I'd have something really special. Mm -hmm. well, the best time for, for things. They had the best cars in the 50s. Mm -hmm. I could fix the engines in the 50s cars. Mm -hmm. You know, you could go out and buy a beautiful 59 Cadillac for 50 bucks way back when. And it was just things that I could relate to more than I could relate to the time around. I, I, I just couldn't relate. I still can't relate to a lot of the things, you know. I, can, I can't relate to Neil Young singing about the homeless when he owns half of Marin County in San Francisco. I can't relate to that. Why, how does he have the nerve to sing about homeless people when he has millions and millions of dollars living in, in, in the lap of luxury? You know, I can't figure that out. You know, if you want to help someone, I think, I don't know how much you can do it through through your songs. My uncle's a, a, a missionary priest in, in Nicaragua, and he's helping people in the village, feeding them. You know, that's helping homeless people. But I don't think you can help homeless people by owning half of San Francisco and preaching about it. You know, so, again, I can't get on with that philosophy. I don't think it, I don't, it doesn't ring true. I, I think it's phony. Do you think there was more truthfulness back in... Well, I think my lyrics are more like the lyrics of like you know a contemporary band like like the Rolling Stones or something. It's more of about emotional issues and relationships and things that turn you on and things that turn you off, rather than preaching about helping uh, you know certain people. I just uh, I don't think it belongs in rock and roll because rock and roll people don't live that kind of life. They're not out there hand to hand helping homeless people. You know, I mean. I, I just think it's funny when Sting preaches, goes down to the the rainforest and, and puts on his tribal makeup, and then he goes back to his suite, his penthouse, you know, in in Colombia. You know, it's just a, and then then they find out that the fence around his house is made from rare South American trees. It's just phony. It's just not true. <laughs> So the guys you're talking about, uh, you know, they tend to be treated more as sort of the heroes. You know, the I know. But you, so maybe I'm missing something. Yeah, but the thing is, that's, I think you're answering the question, but you're saying, do you think you're getting the short end of the stick from the media because you're probably dismissed as, a, as a, you know, compared to those guys, maybe they think of you as more of a lightweight, you know? Um, only in America. Uh -huh. Only in America. In England, where we, we play the same size places as those people do. <laughs> We, we play 10,000-seat arenas in, in England, Germany, France, even Japan. They have more of an understanding for the music and the lifestyle. Um, and in America, they don't. So I feel I'm getting the short end of the stick in America. I feel that people are easily led, and they don't really question too much. Well, why do you think that's the case in America? I don't know. I can't figure it out. I, I don't understand it. I don't know why. Could it be that in uh, foreign countries they value these more traditional American music forms? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. They understand it a lot more. I don't know, I just talked to an English guy, a German guy, and they relate more to me. You know, I, I, I don't relate as much to Americans. They don't quite understand. We don't connect. That's the way it is. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, in America, we see you as like a next-door neighbor. The guys in Europe or Japan, they see you as more like a, a museum piece. No, they're, they don't. They're, they're, one of, they're one of us. They, 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 you think they appreciate you more... For, for, for who you are. Oh, absolutely. They know exactly what, I mean, they, they ask me how, what I'm doing on the guitar, and they know, they, they, hear, they hear Charlie Christian in my guitar playing. You know, in America, they don't know who Charlie Christian is, you know. <laughs> you know, they're talking about Ben Halen. I mean, they, 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 they are more knowledgeable, you know. Huh, huh, yeah. Well, I guess you appeal to the connoisseurs, then. I don't. I. I don't know. I. I just don't know anymore. I just do what I do, and and I'm happy with that. You know. Uh -huh. just, uh, that's why we hardly tour America. You know. Uh -huh. How many tour America? Well, yeah. I mean, 
pretty much. I mean, I would love to have a hit record again. You know, I don't. I, I don't think it's without of out of grasp. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, I'm skinny. I have a full head of hair. I, you know, I, <laughs> I'm not 55 years old and I'm over the hill. You know, I, I think it's within reason. You know, I, um, I would love to be popular in America, but if not, I mean, I'm perfectly content. I live most of my life in Europe anyway. I live three three quarters of the year in Europe, so. Is that mean touring, or is yeah. it actually just living? Touring. Uh huh. Right. And living, yeah. yeah. So. Let's let's wrap it up with this. If I'm missing something, there's going to be two thousand people there tonight that are missing it, and two thousand people outside that can't get in who are missing something too. <laughs> so if I'm missing something, I'm not the only one. Wait, 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 something. Well, I mean, if, if if I'm doing something that's you know, you know, out of sync, with the time. Out of sync or something, there's there's millions of people that are out of sync with me. So <laughs> it wasn't an accusation. Yeah. Well, I, so what I'm trying to say is, it's not that there's just a handful of small people that like this sort of music and this lifestyle. There's millions of them. So, uh -huh. yeah. so I feel like I'm doing something good. Uh -huh. Well, we, we we recognize it. Okay. <laughs> and we laud you for it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, kind of. He, he, he uh, Brian this takes us back a couple of steps here, but he was wondering what, why did you step off track with the with that solo project in the first place? Um, I just got tired of playing uh, with Jim and Lee. We had grown apart as friends, you know. We didn't really hang out together anymore, and I just uh, I kind of lost track of what I really liked to do, and. Uh, I was very young, you know, 20, 22 years old. And um, I listened to a lot of other people telling me, uh, you know, you should be by yourself, you don't need Jim and Lee. And I lived in New York and they lived in California and we drifted apart. And in the interim I made a couple of solo records. And uh, in, in that time period too, um, I wanted to try playing different guitars and using different things and I realized that really the way I play best and what I like to do best is to play my Gretsch guitar through a Fender amp, you know. That's, and uh, that was the second part of the question is when when did you realize that that was your real style that, that was you Kind of when I started making the second album. Mm -hmm. You know, I realized boy I really miss playing, you know, rock and roll, rockabilly music, you know. Mm -hmm. And I started to do it again. Like on live nude guitars on mm -hmm. my second album. Mm -hmm. That that's pretty rock and roll. That's right. pretty much what I started to get back into. But it wasn't as good without Jim and Lee. Mm. I couldn't find guys to play it as good. Nowhere near as good, you know. Mm. Well, that, uh, was Dave Edmonds who first gave you the name Stray Cats? No? no? No, we thought it up. Oh, you thought it up, but you want to know what kind of relationship you had with Dave Edmonds. How did you get to know him? We got to know Dave because we met him in England. Uh -huh. And he was one of my guitar heroes. <laughs> and um, we wanted to make, you know, a modern sound and record. And Dave wanted just became friends and uh, he was the perfect choice to produce the Stray Cats because uh, he was familiar with all the original rock and roll tricks and sounds and echoes and studio things yet he was going to make a modern record for us you know so he was the one to use <laughs> so, Josh, I